Hi, I'm Ahmed Kara. I'm chair of the American Heart Association Committee on Scientific Sessions Programming. Excited to talk to you about some of the great late breakers coming out of the ACC 2023 Scientific Sessions. And and pleased to be joined by, by my colleague who's in the live session there. Uh, Joe? Hey, Ahmed. My name is Joe Chikwi, co-chair with Ahmed Kara for AHA Scientific Sessions. Well, let's just jump in right now. I, I, you know, it kicked off with clear outcomes. I'm a preventive cardiologist. We were waiting for this one. And, you know, just a little bit of reflection on that one. As we know, um, lipid lowering therapy, a backbone of preventive cardiology, but, you know, statin myalgia, whether, whether real or perceived, affects a lot of individuals. And so a lot of interest in new agents, particularly this one, which um, really is, is tested here in, in, you know, several thousand individuals with statin myalgia. And, you know, first, it's well tolerated. We knew this from before, but like all things, we're waiting for outcomes data. And here we have it. Um, congratulations to the investigators. Uh, it took a, a while to get this and also during COVID, but but really what they showed was that um, this uh, pepidoic acid when, when given to primary and secondary prevention patients, predominantly those with secondary prevention, um, did lower cardiovascular outcomes modestly, about a 13% uh, reduction in cardiovascular events, but that, that, was, that was important and statistically significant. You know, this is balanced by slight increased risk of which we had seen before of, of gout. Uh, we saw a renal signal a little bit. We we'll want to know more about that and, and cholelithiasis. So there's always trade-offs like with all medications. But, you know, to me, the, the main take home here was, you know, as a preventive cardiologist and cardiologists in general, we, we have another drug in an armamentarium, uh, another option. And to me, I want a broad toolkit. So there's more tools in the toolkit, which is great for patients and also for, for uh, providers. Uh, and now the challenge always is, you know, which which medicine for what patient and what setting and balancing cost and things like that. So more to be learned on the implementation side, but um, wonderful to have another uh, another option in our toolkit. Um, for you, I know is a, 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 a surgeon, a, a structural person, Triluminate, a big study. Tell me your thoughts on that. Well, this one's a fascinating one, but not yet surgical. So in Triluminate, we're really looking at medical management versus tricuspid edge-to-edge -edge repair, transcatheter approach to treat severe tricuspid regurgitation in symptomatic patients. And these are the sick patients with RV failure that really haven't been let's just say they've been undertreated by surgery. There's an estimate that 1.6 million patients are affected by this and the surgical numbers nationally are probably less than eight, 900 patients a year getting isolated tricuspid repair. So this group planned to randomize 700. I think they called the trial at 350 patients to medical management or transcatheter edge to edge. And the primary endpoint was all cause mortality or heart failure, hospitalization and quality of life improvements. And the real take home from this is that tricuspid edge to edge repair did reduce the degree of regurgitation. So 87% of patients, I think, had moderate um, tricuspid regurgitation or a lesser degree at the one year endpoint. This is a short trial in terms of the, the length of follow up. Um, and that was associated with a, about a 15 point change in KCCQ. I think there's been a lot of discussion as to whether that's going to be enough to really drive treatment changes. I, I think genuinely we know from surgical series that. Um, the, the key here is to eliminate tricuspid regurgitation of what you want is long-term benefit and potentially even to see a survival difference. One of the hallmarks of this trial was the really excellent heart failure management of patients in this trial. I think to entry, they had to get a wedge pressure down below 15. And the less than 10%, I think, mortality at one year really speaks to their effectiveness in doing that. I think certainly from a surgical standpoint and from a patient care standpoint, what I'd be really interested to see is a trial of surgery versus transcatheter approaches in patients before they get to that burnt out stage, because we really advocate for intervention in asymptomatic patients before their RVs deteriorate, because once they've deteriorated and they've got end organ dysfunction, this is a really, really hard and unrewarding condition to, to manage. So I, I, I'm curious, it. there were a couple of other trials which uh, weren't in the interventional space, um, which is the one that you wanted to talk about next. Well, I, I thought, you know, one thing this Better Care HF, I thought was was quite interesting, you know, is we're all working with the EHR all day long. And, and here they were testing, um, you know, first the, the situation, uh, individuals with heart failure, we know that um, guideline directed medical therapy is underutilized. And particularly we think about, you know, quad therapy are four standard drugs now. Um, here they're looking specifically at, at MRAs, at mineral corticoid receptor antagonists, but it was more about the, the design. You know, we all sit at the computer and everyone's trying to think how to uh, have uh, providers again enhance use of these therapies. So here they're looking at clinical decision support and sort of one is usual care, 
Uh, one arm was, at, you know, at the point of care, a best practice alert, which is, you know, a little bit of the bane of our existence as providers. But, and then the third was a, a, an email essentially telling you about care gaps. And, you know, as much as we all talk about clinical decision support, actually testing these strategies and seeing what works is, is really important. So there's the heart failure component, but equally as much as this clinical decision support. Um, you know, what they found was that MRA use did significantly increase with um, that best practice alert, but also with the uh, email, if you will, but much more so with the best practice alert. So as much as I, I worry about getting more BPAs, they, they seem to work. And so I think is, you know, this is exactly it where we need to actually test and not just assume what would work uh, in terms of effectiveness. But, you know, knowing the burden of heart failure, the importance we, we've seen now in getting patients on quad therapy, I, I think we're gonna see more uh, strategies using the EHR as we've seen in this meeting and in others of how to enhance uh, uh, guideline-directed medical therapy. And I think it's it, this is important, not just for obviously here for heart failure, but there are other entities in cardiovascular medicine where it does help us understand what what uh, what decision support within the electronic health record might be the most effective strategy. Well, we go from um, you know individual patients and and in in providers to sort of population health, and uh, we think about a vaccination. There was this nudge flu study. Um, what were your thoughts about that? Well, that one's an interesting one. So this is a again similar use of electronic nudges to kind of try and change care but this one's aimed at patients rather than providers so in this case uh, about i want to say several tens of thousands 346,000 um, danish patients were randomized to either receiving an electronic letter to prompt them to get, take a flu vaccine or not and i the results to me really kind of highlight that maybe that this is that there's an achilles heel to this approach i mean literally there was a 1% difference 80% i think of patients who didn't get a letter versus 81% of those that did went on to get a flu vaccine and, th and that really speaks to how we can better engage with our patients how we can better educate them particularly when we're trying to address underserved communities in even more um, cardiovascularly important therapies um, clearly there's an opportunity here but just a lesson doesn't seem to drive the kind of response from patients that we might look for yeah, I think you're right. You know, statistically significant because there were you know you know a large number of sample size, but the actual difference was quite small. But I, I give them credit for trying to look at different messaging. We think about implementation science about different messaging and different approaches and what might work best. So you know, more work to be done for sure, uh, but but uh, not quite the overwhelming up, uptick in, in flu vaccine that we'd hope. Well, I think it's an exciting session. I know you're still there, and there's more going on today, uh, so it'll continue to be an exciting session. We think. You know, late breakers are a cornerstone of meetings and um, certainly some great ones coming out of ACC uh, 23. So we hope everyone enjoys the rest of their sessions and uh, learns a lot from the different late breakers coming out.